Bald eagles are just, they're amazing creatures. Their size, their wingspan, uh, six, seven, eight feet. They're just so, so big and so mean looking and strong looking. It's a majestic sight. The white head, the white tail, just makes it stand out. They truly are a, a sentinel of our wild lands. When you see an eagle flying in the air and soaring through the prairie wind, it lifts up your heart and it's a very uh, good feeling. When we come out here to the river and we see them flying up there, it, it just takes your breath away. It's such a mighty, mighty bird. When you see an eagle for the first time, it's the kind of thing that raises the hair on, on, on the back of your neck, you know, sends shivers up your spine. It's just uh, something that you point out to your kids and you say, this is a special moment. That especially when you understand that we were in danger of losing them. It's our national symbol. It's a, the symbol of, of the United States to the world. They represent freedom and strength and to have them vanish from Arizona skies I think would be shameful. Funding for this program was provided by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, the Salt River Project, and the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I take people on, on helicopter tours up to visit our reservoirs and dams. Um, people in local leadership groups, you know, politicians, um, and I always point out, you know, you know most of Arizona's bald eagle population is along the Salt and Verde rivers and their tributaries. And everybody kind of looks at me. Really? <laughs> Do we have bald eagles? Yeah, we have bald eagles. The story of North America's bald eagle is one of survival and rebirth. For hundreds, possibly thousands of years, the bald eagle has thrived in one of the most extreme and demanding habitats on Earth, the American Southwest, a place better known for its scorpions and rattlesnakes than its raptors. You can have a, uh, a stream with saguaros on the foothills and a bald eagle nesting in a cottonwood tree or in a pinnacles or on rock ledges. It's just not typical of bald eagles throughout most of their range. But that's what makes them unique. They've adapted the Sonoran Desert ecosystem in these riverine type habitats. And for me, you know, there are a lot of eagles um, throughout various parts of the country in Alaska and all, but they're, um, they just handle themselves differently. Arizona has the most. We probably have about 80% of all the birds uh, from West Texas over to the coast in California and down into Mexico. So we really are the, the lion's share of, of the eagle in the Southwest. The bald eagle here in the Southwest is, is very similar uh, in appearance and, uh, to eagles elsewhere in, in the U.S. Uh, they are a little smaller in size. They primarily eat fish. You know, that's, what they, that's, that's what they rely upon but they'll eat anything. You know, they'll, they'll augment that primarily fish-eating diet with waterfowl, mammals, amphibians, reptiles. But fish is what they rely upon. And fish is, what's, is what drives where they nest and what drives the kind of success that they have. If you were to go plot the locations of nests uh, in the central Arizona area, you'd see all these little dots all along the rivers and, and lakes. Most of those waterways are in the central part of the state, so that's where you see the majority of our eagle population. And that ranges from uh, just outside of the Metro Phoenix area up to, uh, up to the mountains. To this day, little is known about the bald eagle's history in the Southwest. The scope of its original range and when the bird began to inhabit the region remains unknown. For generations, Native American Indians have passed down stories of the eagle's power and importance, a role that has not faded with time. The eagle is a, a symbol that connects us to our Creator. We send our prayers and we receive prayers through the eagle. And uh, 
it, it's one way that, uh, again, that we are wanting to, to hold sacredness, the, the ego itself, and, and make sure that we preserve and that we um, protect and that we um, respect the, 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 the animal itself. As European immigrants moved into the American Southwest in the 19th century, they began to note its unique plant and wildlife. But it wasn't until 1890 that Arizona's first recorded breeding bald eagles were spotted nesting on the forested shores of Stoneman Lake, south of present-day Flagstaff. Then later in the 1930s was the first uh, documented uh, breeding of bald eagles in the desert environments, with the one here at Bartlett Lake being one of those first two documented. It started out in a little crack in the cliffs, um, and with eagles breeding at the same location for, uh, shoot, 80 years, it has grown to uh, be over 15 feet from top to bottom. While their presence was documented, little was known about how the eagle survived in the southwest. Whether the population was just snowbirds migrating here to escape harsh winters in the north, or even just how many birds lived in the region. However, by the latter half of the 20th century, one thing was clear. The widespread use of an insecticide called DDT was killing America's bald eagles. Essentially what happened is the DDT would get into the water systems, it would get into the fish. The eagles would eat the fish as their primary food source. As a result of that, uh, widespread reproductive failures were seen nationwide. And from that was generated a recovery plan for recovery of the bald eagle in the southwestern portion of its range in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. And again, at that point, Arizona had the most eagles, and so, which wasn't many, it was, you know, about a dozen pairs of eagles, so it became the focus of a large of the recovery effort in the southwestern recovery region. By the early 1980s, the original recovery goals were within reach. Despite an increase in breeding pairs, the very existence of the bald eagle in the southwest was still very much in danger. What was needed was a more focused and coordinated effort by all entities committed to the conservation and vitality of the bald eagle. And so, in 1984, the Southwest Bald Eagle Management Committee was formed. It was created to help people work together. So we've got, you know, tribes, federal agencies, state agencies, parks, power companies. We've got a whole collection of people that are now participating in bald eagle management, coordination, cooperation, all towards that common goal. Although we didn't know very much about the bald eagle, we didn't know what our historic numbers were here. Uh, we were able to, to maintain a few breeding areas and just do everything in our power to make sure that those breeding areas were successful, produced young, and those young were able to repopulate uh, this area. The Arizona population has rebounded phenomenally with the conservation measures we've implemented. We're not out of the woods yet. We still have uh, impending management actions that still need to be implemented in order to ensure the long-term success of the population in Arizona. That's why the Southwestern Bald Eagle Management Committee continues to meet and we continue to implement management programs for the species in the state. Nationally, the bald eagle is back. Between 1974 and 2006, the number of bald eagle breeding pairs in the contiguous 48 states jumped from 791 to nearly 10,000. Yet, despite its national success, many still share concern for the bald eagle in the Southwest. We only have so many cottonwood trees where the bald eagles can nest. We only have so many cliff sites where they could nest. There are activities that the Southwest Bald Eagle Management Committee has been involved with, along with the partnership of the other federal, state, private organizations and the tribes uh, to uh, build better habitats. So we've done cottonwood and willow pole plantings in the area with success. If we can provide critters um, appropriate habitats, then usually they can take care of themselves. You know, sometimes it's, uh, it's not in the cards and we have to kind of step in and, and help that along. For over 30 years, man has been helping the bald eagle in Arizona 
by ensuring that breeding pairs have habitat where food is available, human disturbance and other threats are minimized, and nesting sites are closely monitored and protected. The focal point of this effort is the nest. At a bald eagle's nest is a big affair. I mean, it's a, it's a great big thing, and, and they keep using the same ones year. They get, you know, every year they add a little more to it, so these things can get just. The adult bald eagles, they will uh, uh, be monogamous. Uh, they'll have one mate, and they'll maintain that mate from uh, year to year. If their mate gets killed, they will then repair with another bird. But for the most part, they stay with the same pairing all through their life. They breed earlier than eagles that are up in the northern part of the country. We start, uh, eagles start here getting active in October and November, and they start laying eggs in December, January, and February. And start fledging in April, May, uh, some as late as June. It works out well here in Arizona. It gets so hot here in the summertime that uh, it's really important that those eagles are able to get out of the nest before we have too many 100 plus degree days. Bald eagles lay one to three eggs. For 35 days, the adult male and female will share in incubating the eggs and protecting them from predators, extreme temperatures, as well as rain and snow. Parental duties that don't end when the eggs hatch. So during that first two to three weeks, the adults are on the nest 24-7, taking care of the nestlings. At this point, they're, they're, they're really small, uh, little fur balls, and, uh, or feather balls. An eagle baby doesn't do a lot except for eat and try and stay in the shade. When it's, when it's really little, less than four weeks old, it can't thermoregulate, which means that it can't regulate its own body temperature. So it's really dependent upon the adults to shade it, to keep it uh, cool, or to, or, to, or to be on top of it to keep it warm. You know, it really is, is all it's trying to do in those early, early uh, uh, weeks is to not succumb to the weather and eat food. After it's grown its feathers, it really looks towards building its muscles. And you'll see it really holding on to a stick in the nest, flapping its wings hard. And, and kind of testing out their feathers, seeing what those things are all about. So when they fly from that nest the first time, they'll hopefully be able to uh, uh, fly successfully and, and not hit the ground. The most sensitive time in a young eagle's life is while it is in the nest. Any disturbance can startle the adult bird into flushing or suddenly leaving the nest. A nestling knocked out of the nest can be killed or injured by the fall. Survivors become easy prey to coyotes and other predators. Nestlings left alone by a flushed adult are also easy prey and subject to death by exposure or dehydration. Low-flying aircraft can cause an eagle to flush the offenders completely oblivious to the destruction they may have caused. Lost or discarded fishing line can entangle nestlings and may result in their injury or death. And it is the very location of the bald eagle's breeding areas along Arizona's rivers and lakes, which make it susceptible to a host of additional human activities that can significantly affect the success of the nest. The most limiting thing to the eagle's success currently is human disturbance and loss of habitat. Um, and human disturbance can be anything from hiking near a nest, uh, equestrian use, low-flying aircraft, target shooting, vehicle use. The boat traffic, the high-intensity boat traffic that goes through, because they're on a cliff so high up, the impact is not that great. Um, but if the fishing boat stops and people happen to look up at the eagle, it has a reaction and it'll flush. It's almost like if you don't pay attention to it, it's, it's okay and it feels safe. That's why things that don't seem extreme like hiking and bird watching could actually impact the eagle. Eagles nest near water. And in an environment like this where we have limited water, everybody wants to be near the water. So you've got a, a management challenge where you've got everybody seeking the same resource, whether it's water or fish, You've got everybody wants that same resource. The need for protective management in areas with high recreational use was recognized as far back as 1978, when the U.S. Forest Service and the Maricopa Audubon Society created the Arizona Bald Eagle Nest Watch Program. Beginning as a weekend volunteer effort, 
The Nest Watch program has expanded into teams of biologists and other people concerned about the eagles, who monitor 10 to 15 nests during each breeding season. Nest watchers live uh, on site for 10 days at a time, uh, take four days off, and uh, they actually become a part of the nesting attempt, if you will. In teams of two, they'll go out to pre-selected sites and monitor these breeding areas from uh, incubation through the time those nestlings fledge. So we get an almost daily account of what's going on in a breeding area. Basically, we're at the OP by about 8 or 8.30 or so, watching the birds, taking notes on what they're doing, um, writing down any human activities within a kilometer of the nest and how the birds are responding to that. You know, they're chasing off intruding birds, they're hunting, they're, you know, bringing in nesting material, um, watching the development of the young. Uh, we'll also write down prey deliveries. Um, if there's chicks in the nest, the adults will start bringing in prey and we keep track of what they're feeding um, and how often are they bringing prey into the nest. There's days when you take three lines of data in three hours and there's days when you take 20 lines of data in three hours. We're just keeping track of their normal day and uh, any disturbances or problems that might arise during the day. If a nest watcher determines an eagle is in peril, they can notify game and fish personnel who will immediately come to the site, assess the situation, and if necessary, perform a rescue. For the last week we've been missing our resident adult female and uh, we had a younger female that kind of moved into the area and starting last night she attacked one of our chicks, took it and threw it out of the nest. Uh, we staged a, rec a rescue for that chick last night and then um, today she attacked again and so we had to stage another rescue for the remaining chicks. The majority of rescues involve nestlings who have fallen from the nest. However, entire nests and even trees have been destroyed by severe storms and floods. Fledglings have been pulled from cactus and even attacked by Africanized bees. It's kind of like almost watching uh like your, like your dog get attacked by something, like, like get, get bit by another dog or something like that. Um, only there's nothing we could do about it. All we could do is sit there and watch and frantically try and radio people. The orphaned eagles are taken to Liberty Wildlife, a volunteer organization that provides medical and rehabilitation care for injured animals. Liberty will even incubate abandoned eggs and raise the nestlings until they are ready to be returned to a nest. After two weeks of rehabilitation, these orphaned eagles are ready to be returned to the wild. We'll find another nest uh, elsewhere in the state that's still active with only one nestling in it and we'll cross foster that nestling into that nest. Uh, luckily the adults, they, they can't count. They, they come to the nest, they see two nestlings, they just start feeding both of them. The real reason that, that these rescues and that level of, of effort is, is necessary, it's that in five, six years, when, when those nestlings become full adults, those are the adults that are driving our population tomorrow. The Arizona Bald Eagle Nest Watch program has been a critical component of uh, bald eagle management in Arizona. Over 60 bald eagles have been rescued from their consistent monitoring of our breeding attempts. But that's just the direct effects. The indirect effects of them talking to people and educating them is, is more than outweighs the direct effects. We probably helped save thousands of bald eagles because of that educational component and getting people involved in the Arizona Bald Eagle Management Program. Perhaps the most important way nest watchers get people involved in restoration of the bald eagle in the southwest is by educating them about the importance of seasonal closures. A closure is an area protected in order to minimize the effects of human disturbance on the breeding attempt. What it does is it, is it closes small area of land and or water 
uh, directly around the nest site, uh, keeping a, a buffer of activity from affecting those nesting birds. It's open only during the breeding season and only when the breeding area is active. Most people are uh, excited about the fact that there's eagles there and willing to, to give the eagles the room that they need to be able to do what they're doing and successfully raise their chicks. We as a federal agency and state agencies can only do so much to protect the species. Depending upon the public's help is critical in their survival. Every year since 1978, each new nestling that can be safely reached is given an ID bracelet of sorts, a band, containing a unique identification code. Banding the little creatures, however, is easier said than done. Sometimes we have to climb up a tree. The largest one here in the state is uh, 110 feet up to the nest. Sometimes we have to rappel uh, down into the cliff, sometimes 100, 200 feet. All right, once we get to the nest, we have to grab the babies. And we have to do that all while either attached to a rope or hanging precariously from a branch of a tree. Well, this is this giant you know, fuzzball, but it's got these just serious claws on it. You know, it's just this great fuzzy, funky little body and these monster talons uh, and a big old serious piece. And sear 15. They're really awkward looking. And 7.5 for big depth. You know, only a mother can love. When you see the little ones, they're, you know, they're, it's, it's kind of comical because uh, the biologists put little booties on their talons so they, they can't uh, grab onto you and they have a hood over their head to calm them down. <laughs> it's getting harder to sneak up on. <laughs> we take a lot of measurements. We have to determine their sex. Uh, we have to determine uh, their health. And we actually have to band them. So we put on these leg bands, basically like bracelets and we put them around their legs and they're fitted for an adult so they'll stay on for the rest of their lives. The bands that we put on these eagles uh, don't cause a detriment to the birds. Uh, we, do, we do have to enter a nest and cause a disturbance for a couple hours, but that disturbance doesn't result in a failure. And uh, that, that couple of hours of disturbance uh, results in a, a lifetime of data that we're able to collect on these bald eagles. So most of the information we've actually uh, used in order to implement management comes from our ability to uh, identify these individuals through this banding process. Arizona's bald eagle population is one of the most researched and therefore best understood in the nation. And these ring size bands make that possible, assuming you can see them. It takes 12 weeks for a nestling to fledge or leave the nest. By then they are as large as an adult eagle. Their plumage, however, is markedly different. For three to four years, they will transition between black, brown, and mottled feathering. And each year, these young birds avoid the brunt of Arizona's summer heat by migrating north to forage on salmon or trout in places like Oregon, Washington, Yellowstone, and Canada. By their fifth year, the iconic white head and tail appear, and they return to Arizona, where they will remain for the rest of their lives. When they return to Arizona, what they're doing is they'll be traveling throughout the state. And by the time they become an adult, they'll probably be kicked out of every single territory in the state. They'll see where those other territories are. They'll see where those other nests are. So they start becoming part of our floating population and actually start to um, establish themselves in our breeding population by looking in these areas where they may be able to fill a vacancy. They'll be looking possibly to create a vacancy by competing with another bird that sometimes results in a mortality. Or they may not breed, they may not find that, or they may try and create a new territory. But as they reach that sexual maturity, that really kind of becomes the focus of their life is, is trying to find that territory, trying to find a mate, create a territory, and, and breed. And the whole cycle starts over again. Just three decades ago, the bald eagle was disappearing from Arizona's skies. Through careful study, habitat restoration and management actions, as well as countless hours put in by nest watchers and volunteers, this animal remains a majestic silhouette on the horizon. Yet as more and more people call Arizona their home, 
competition for its precious water and pressure on its wild lands will only increase. Continued cooperation among the agencies of the Southwestern Bald Eagle Management Committee and broad public awareness and support is crucial to ensure continued survival of the bald eagle in the Southwest. I compare it to having a woolly mammoth on the quarter and the dollar bill and you know having your little kids saying well what's that? Well it's something we used to have. You know we never want to get to the point with the bald eagle where this is something we used to have. So when we come out here to the river and we see them flying up there it, it just takes your breath away. We all have a, a vested interest in the continuation of every species not only the bald eagle but every species on the planet um, without which you know the, the the circle of life isn't quite complete. I have a personal obligation to try to ensure that my children and my grandchildren will have that same opportunity to see our, our national symbol in the wild, uh, see it catching fish, you know, see it catch, feeding its, its young. And um, I think people want those kinds of opportunities. I think people need those kinds of opportunities to have that connection with our wild lands, with our environment.